Hello, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you today to our second module of um, digital neonatal nursing course. Today, we will be talking about neonatal resuscitation. My name is Margarita Singer, and I'm the regional marketing manager and the training manager for Draeger. And today, I am happy to welcome all of you to our webinar and of course, welcome our esteemed speaker, uh, Ms. Linda Pretorius. Linda um, has graduated um, with a specialization in uh, pediatrics and neonatology. She worked for a very long time in the UK until she came back to South Africa and joined the NetCare uh, group of hospitals. She helped them to establish the trauma programs and she worked a very long time in their NICUs and pediatric units. And then she uh, went on to establish the Little Miracle organization. And now she is helping parents and healthcare practitioners to really help optimize caring for the very preterm infants, working with parents to support them from psychological perspective working with parents to support them from the developmental care perspective. Linda has saved so many lives, not only in South Africa, but also in the other African countries. And I'm extremely honored to have her as a speaker today. So um, as a part of today's webinar, we're gonna have um, a theoretical um, and clinically uh, relevant information from Linda. Uh, from her clinical experiences and from her clinical practices. And then we're going to have um, half an hour to 40 minutes introduction to the Drager Resuscitator um, that is in line with what Linda will be presenting. So um, before we start, I would like to address a few organizational um, topics. So first of all, for those of you who are dialing in in groups, so if let's say you have decided to get together with a group of nurses from your hospital and watch the webinar together, please keep in the attendee list. So if you can fill in the attendee list and uh, with signatures on the hospital um, paper and then share with us the list so we could track the attendance and if needed, we can issue the certificate because without the attendee list, it would be very difficult for us to track your um, uh, attendance. And also we're going to have three main sessions today. So we're going to have the first theoretical part and we're going to cover some of your questions. We're going to take a break and then continue with the second clinical part, again presented by Linda, and we're going to address your questions again. And we're going to have a short break and address the um, technology insight, we call it, um, the questions related to the resuscitator. So for those of you who have questions, you have the possibility to type them in into the question box. So um, whenever you get a question, just type it in and we will try to address this at the end of the webinar. If for whatever reason we don't have the time or the technical capabilities to answer your questions, we will follow up on your question in the direct communication to you. So without further delay, I would like to uh, give word to Ms. Linda Pretorius and we are going to start with our webinar. So So Linda is now going to start with the uh, first part um, of neonatal resuscitation. So Linda, the stage is yours. Thank you, Marguerite, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so firstly, um, I am going to talk a bit and answer a few questions of what we dealt with last week last month and also just to say thank you to everybody who um, 
it did attend last 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 month session and um, what you can see here is where were you from so basically thank you to everybody who did um, and so we will now just give you a few interesting statistics so 26 countries attended the first webinar 219 people um, finished the first module if there is a huddle please as margarita said let us know about that because we need to know that um we how many of you are there um and it it is very important 88 hospitals i could find 88 hospitals and 10 departments of health and ministries of health attended thank you thank you very much um we did send out a communication sort of mid month for you to add to last month's lecture if you found that um, article interesting, please let us know and we will consider continue that, continuing that. So let's recap. Last um, time, there were quite a few questions as to where to put the temperature probe. And I think this is very, very important. So I have put this little graph here for you. And as you can see, it says, do not place on bony prominences, especially here, if the baby is prone on the back, on the scapulas, be careful for those areas because it can cause a problem. Also avoid areas of brown fat deposit. That would be the back, which is where we often see it, along here on the thighs and up here on the arms. So the area that's mostly used is this area around here. Just be careful not to put it on the liver. You can put it under the liver, but not on the liver because the liver does generate quite a bit of heat. Be careful of poorly vas vascular areas. You know, you shouldn't really be putting it unless it's the auxiliary um, temp probe on the feet. Just be careful of that burnt areas or, or areas where the skin is broken down and keep the probe exposed to the heat source. So if this baby is on an open incubator and we've got the probe sitting here, we mustn't cover it with a blanket or whatever else because the reflector actually helps send the message, the correct message and the correct temperature to the incubator and keep it securely attached. Is always a problem that if it's loose, it's not going to give you the accurate reading. And the problem there is that if you have many incubators in an area and they keep coming on to try and adjust the temperature because it is not securely attached, it will change that whole area's temperature anyway and your air conditioner might work hard or not work at all. The next um, problem or the next issue that arose was that people did not understand where what was meant when we said use the preductal saturation. So I am I have now put a picture here for you. There is the ductus arteriosus over there, and what it means preductally is, as you can see, as the bump, the blood pumps out of this left ventricle and it goes up into the aorta. These vessels here are coming off first. And the, these ones here are the ones that, that will be preductally in front of the ductus. That will give you the most accurate saturation reading. Therefore, the right arm is better than the left arm and the rest of the body. So that's very important that you understand that preductally, it's these three vessels on the top of the aorta which get the better oxygenated blood. And that's why we go preductally because obviously these go to the brain as well, which will give us a very a, a good reading of what's happening to the brain. The important other thing to remember is that at a one minute, the target is 60 to 65 two minutes, 65 to 70, and so it progressively gets more. It is about being calm and being concise and being gentle in your resuscitation. That is important. Humidification, this also, I think, 
a lot of us realized how important humidification is, ex especially in the micro premi and where we're going with that. And I think that um, perhaps we didn't explain it completely <clears throat> clearly to you. So the micro prem has a very thin skin. The stria and the granular, these areas here are very, very thin initially. And it takes about 14 days for the skin to mature or to keratinize. So how do we use humidity? For the first seven days, we try and run the humidity just on 80 or above. And if the baby becomes hypothermic, you wean the temperature, not the humidity in a hybrid incubator. Then on day eight, we start slowly now reducing the humidification. So we go from, from 80 to 75 to 70 to 65, and we slowly bring it down. On day 14, it's at 45. We're not going to leave it there because hybrid incubators are expensive. People can't afford them. And so very often at this stage, we will remove this prem infant from this hybrid incubator and put them into a normal incubator and they will be fine because the striation of the skin has occurred. So it remains important that we ensure that we wean that humidification down. The blood pressure check, a lot of you also were like, how do we do this, Linda? So um, I have now found a picture that will sort of do it. So what you're going to do is you're going to do the blood pressure and record the reading. So you can see this baby has what we've got term a nest. And what we suggest is that you lift the legs up to about 45 degree angle and then repeat the blood pressure. Should the mean blood pressure be more or less the same? It's actually indicative that that baby doesn't need fluid, but rather needs an inotrope. Whereby, if it is a fluid problem, the mean blood pressure will improve by at least 10 millimeters of mercury, eight to 10. That tells you the baby needs fluid. Remember that your other check there from last month's lecture is that you will look at the heart rate and what the heart rate is doing. Because children, babies that have that need fluids, heart rate usually goes up because they're dehydrated. We don't have the circulatory volume we should have, and the heart has to work harder to pump the volume it does have around. Fluid resuscitation. There were also a few questions regarding that. I think the first concept to, 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 to explain to you is this whole idea of third spacing and what third spacing means. Very often during a resuscitation, babies get a lot of fluid and then at about 24 hours post resuscitation, they blow up like little frogs. And the reason for this is, is that very often you'll refer to medical people talking about, oh, it's all sitting in third space. Well, where is third space? So as you can see here, we have put a little picture here. This is the circulation or the blood vessel. That is the cell. And the fluid around the cell is what we call third space. So if you're giving a baby a fluid bolus and it's given too slowly, all it does is it comes from out of the circulation. It comes here out of circulation and it moves straight into third space instead of entering the dehydrated cell. So how do we do it? It's usually 10 to 20 moles, start off conservatively, 10 moles per kilo of crystalloid initially. What is a crystalloid? A crystalloid is something like Ringer's sodium chloride. We generally don't use um, a sugar-based crystalloid. So it would be Ringer's or, or sodium chloride. And we give that over a 10 minute period. So 10, probably first start with 10 moles per kilo to increase the fluid and, 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 and improve your blood pressure because that's what you're trying to do over 10 minutes to prevent this third space loss. Because now it will return to circulation. It will give you a better mean blood pressure. It will slowly bring down the heart. And in that way, the baby regulates. Be careful of too much crystalloid 
This is a big mistake often even made in adult resuscitation. In adult resuscitation, we always talk about one liter of crystalloid and then start your colloid transfusions, your bloods, your FFPs, your platelets, whatever else. And the rule then there is if you have to give blood, you give one red packed cells, one white, which is then one of the other crystalloid uh, colloids like platelets or um, plasma, one of those. And that prevents the DIC. Too much fluid will lead to a DIC, so be very careful there. A colloid is something like FFP, blood or albumin. If given correctly and over 10 minutes, you will notice that your heart rate will slowly start to come down. So instead of being a tachycardia, it will now normalize. Please remember that you still have to remember that the ranges that you are dealing with with that baby is very, very important. So if you're dealing with a micropreme who has a heart rate of 190 and you've given them and they weigh a kilogram and we've given 10 moles of fluid over 10 minutes, the heart rate will slowly come down, usually to about 170, 160. That's telling you that your fluid is doing its job. ECG placement. Remember, we discussed that you needed the triangle of your ECG for the algorithm in your monitor to work and that the triangle needs to be as wide as possible. Again, I make the point, never ever put an electrode over a nipple because if that electrode by some horrid way removes that nipple, the baby's entire breast tissue, if it is a girl, is in that nipple at this stage of development. So please let us be very, very careful. Try and get your triangle as wide as you possibly can, and that will give you the better ECG reading. It is also very important that you know which goes where. So generally, it would be something like read your book, red, black, white, just so that you know. Why do we resuscitate? Well, I'm just going to give you a very short period of this. Um, I'm hoping that this hospital where this baby was born from did actually um, last time watch this webinar. I'm not going to disclose to you now. Um, I have got a few videos over the course of this course that I will play to you. And to show you, this is baby K. Ooh, ooh. Um, I am going to take you back there and not play the video. This little girl was born at 1.3 kilograms at 29 weeks. She went down to 985 grams. She was resuscitated, ventilated, and looked after. And look at her today. This video was taken two days ago. She's 11 months old and she's walking at 29 weeker. The mother needs an extreme amount of praise, but so do the people who resuscitated her, because this is rare for a 29-weeker at 11 months to walk. There's nothing wrong with her knees. The mother insists on covering her knees because she crawls everywhere. But I'm going to give you a short again. Look at her eye contact. Look at how she's walking. Look at how well she's doing. This is why we resuscitate. Oops, I missed it. So now let's get on to today's. We're talking resuscitation. This is what resuscitation looked like through the ages. They used bellows. The middle um, picture is one where they tried to revive preemies. I mean, it is just archaic. And then the oxygen in the late 50s and early 40s, this is how they were administering oxygen then. One of the very, very important things to remember about resuscitation is that the newborn resuscitation is very different. 
to the resuscitation that often occurs in the neonatal intensive care unit. The newborn resuscitation is generally with regards to um, the uh, ensuring that the, the, the baby um, usually has had a respiratory event and um, the recess is almost easier than, than anything else that, that, that goes with it. So please remember that um, it, it follows immediately after delivery and it's mostly about a failure to ventilate. Whereas with the newborn resuscitation, very often they have stopped breathing. There is a difference there. Usually the newborn resuscitation shows a respiratory acidosis, whereby the neonatal resuscitation shows a mixed acidosis. And we will cover that a bit later. The newborn baby is usually normothermic because it's just been born, whereby the recess of a re neonatal intensive care recess, generally these babies are actually hypothermic. They have slowly been deteriorating and they cannot control their temperatures. Newborn resuscitations, there's often a low glucose, whereby with the NICU or the NICU resus, we find that mostly these babies are actually hyperglycemic. And that is because of the stress that we've put them under. The cause of the newborn resuscitation, it could be medication that the mother has received, especially analgesia, long deliveries, which have caused deaccelerations, and an acute event like a cord which has suddenly wrapped around the neck or has snapped. And generally with a newborn resuscitation, we can pretty quickly correct it. However, when we look at the NICU resuscitation, there are many causes. Generally it's sepsis, respiratory failure, something like in respiratory failure, we're looking at um, constant apneas, we're looking at a pneumothorax, something that is causing the respiratory system to fail. Hypovolemia, far more common than we actually admit. Cardiac lesions, especially on day two, three, we start seeing quite a few of our cardiac lesions. And then the electrolyte imbalances. This often happens in the, in the incubator, something like sodiums dropping, sodiums climbing, that sort of problem, potassiums. Um, the newborn recess, obviously we work them up, but when it comes to the NICU recess, we have to look at them extensively, exclude sepsis, exclude um, organ failures, exclude all of that. So let's talk about APGAR because the APGAR is what we do when a baby is born at one minute, five minutes and 10 minutes. And APGAR can be and is very, very subjective. Um, a lot of people tend to overshoot it. They tend to give themselves better scores because they think they're scoring themselves and not the baby. So we look at the respiration and whether the baby's crying or not. We look at the reflexes, how irritable the baby is. We look at the pulse or the heart rate. We look at skin color and the extremities and we look at muscle tone. And each of those will carry the um, highest number that it can get is two and the lowest number that it can get is one. You do not give half. There is no such thing. It's either one or zero. It has to be scored like that. So we look at appearance. If the baby's blue all over, it scores zero. If it scores, if it's blue just on the extremities, it's one. If there is no blue discoloration, it is a two. The pulse, no pulse, it is zero. A pulse below 100 is one. And a pulse above 100 for, at minute one is two. Then we look at stimuli. And this is how the baby is reacting. And there you can see the grimace, which the G stands for. Activity, no activity, some activity or active. And respiration, no breathing, weak, slow or irregular breathing or a strong cry. This is 
um, why we like to use something like a resuscitate that has an inbuilt clock. But if you don't have that, a kitchen clock could work that just gets set at one minute or gets set at five minutes or gets set at 10 minutes. Even a cell phone could be used in this instance. Glucose. Glucose remains very important and should be done within the first minute if we possibly can. Um, and it's very, very important. The actual new suggestion is that we will accept this lower reading of 2.4 as low as 2.1. However, it is very important that the glucose gets done. One mil of dextrose 50% in one mil of water per kilogram is given to correct this. Okay. And it can be given in various ways. It can be given IV, but it can also be given orally. If the baby in that first golden hour is still battling and you can get colostrum, colostrum tends to really stabilize a baby fairly quickly. Um, and it, because of its high fat content, um, it will stabilize the baby. Remembering that the, 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 the brain is only fluid, fueled by glucose or fat. So we need to somehow get that glucose up. Guys, please remember it's very, very important that we use these areas here to do the heel prick, not this area and not this area here. And the reason why you're doing this is that there is a nerve that runs under here, the plant the nerve that runs here. If you happened for some reason to actually hit that nerve and it happens, these children later on when I see them tiptoe walk and they tiptoe walk because of the incredible pain that they've had for months at here on the heel aspect. It's always to the side that we must do it. And we must be careful with the way we do it because most of these children will later show an aversion to having been pricked on their feet. I ask all my mommies that are still in neonatal intensive care to daily massage those feet just to get the child used to that normal touch doesn't hurt. The baby's born and we're going to use the TART method to look at the baby. Is the baby term? That's the first T. Is there no meconium aspiration? The A for aspiration. Is their baby's re re respiration regular? The R. And has the baby got good tone? And if your ticks are, if there are four ticks and the baby has passed the TART test, that baby immediately goes skin to skin, goes to mum. That needs to happen with every delivery that is normal. Why is skin to skin part of a resuscitation? Um, I'm not sure if our Kenyan colleagues have joined us today, but I will explain how this works. Um, for many years, we were unable to um, keep baby or neonatal elephants alive. And those of you across the globe that don't know, elephants are actually now becoming endangered. And one of the reasons why we couldn't keep the elephants alive was because A, we didn't have the correct formula. Once that was sorted out, the second thing that happened was that they still remained very, very vulnerable and were dying. And what the, um, the, the researchers realized was that baby elephants, after they are born, get placed under the mother's abdomen in the folds of her abdominal skin. And that pressure actually orientates the baby elephant and allows it to regulate, to bring its heart rate down. And so what they then realized when they got these little neonatal elephants into these sanctuaries is that they needed to put the blankets, a heavy, a fairly heavy blanket on the elephant and tie it in this way. And that way the elephant settled down because now they were mimicking skin to skin with the mother. So why do we start it? If we have to do it in that mammal, we need to look at it in the, in 
the human um, in the human baby. So the reason why is that it starts attachment because there's this secretion of oxytocin and that allows for eye contact between baby and mother and that starts the attachment system of the baby. The fact that the baby is skin to skin immediately stimulates milk production. It reduces stress both in the baby and in the mother. And, and the, the latest research is showing that a stressed mother, her facial expressions will carry over to the baby because babies read nonverbal cues. They, we also, it prevents um, late onset sepsis because it is now colonizing that baby with its mother's colony on her skin and not what we are secreting in the unit and putting on the baby. Remember that many of us actually are probably carrying um, um, hospital acquired bugs and are carrying antibiotic resistant bugs. What does it stabilize or what should it do? It allows the BP to normalize, it allows the heart rate to normalize, it allows the respiration to normalize, and it will help with the glucose because the temperature is more controlled. So now, because the temperature is more controlled, you're using the least amount of energy and oxygen that the baby requires to sustain life and be healthy. Let's talk about fetal circulation because I think very often people don't understand how it works. The placenta is almost um, an adaption between a kidney and a lung. And they are thing, they, they, it's where the mother's blood meets up with the baby's blood. They do not actually mix, but we get the diffusion of nutrients and oxygen across this placenta. So what will happen is that, oops, the, um, the circulation from the mother will come from this side and here the exchange will happen. From the mother, it comes the normal way. So it comes with the uterine arteries to this area. It leaves via the, the uterine veins. However, from the baby, it is different. It works like the lung. In that, it will come the oxygen and um, poor uh, blood and the nutrient poor blood will come via the umbilical arteries, the two of them, and the newly, the new blood that is now oxygenated and has nutrients will arrive, will return, oops, sorry, to the baby via the umbilical vein. This is very important concept to remember. And to know that when we talk about delayed cord clamping, we are actually allowing for the blood from the baby to return back this way. It can be as much as 70 moles, guys, 70 to 100 moles to return to the baby before we, we clamp that cord. It's very, very important. Also to note here is two things, and this is just my trauma background talking. The ductus arteriosus and the, the ductus venosum, yeah, they remain there, they become the tendon. If later in life, um, under the age of 40, this, this human being is in a car accident and happens to hit a steering wheel, often the injury we see, and even in children in car accidents, that pass away, often the injury we see is when the forward propulsion of that person is here on the ductus arteriosus and they hit the steering wheel, they hit the dashboard. That's where it tears the fourth quadrant of the liver and they bleed here and often pass away. Or like Princess Diana, she tore her ductus arteriosus here and she bled from her aorta into this area here. So those two structures remain very important and being aware of them. 
the ductus arteriosus, let's just talk about fetal circulation. So when the baby is not born, okay, it's in the uterus, the blood is coming into, from the superior vena cava, into the right atrium, the right ventricle, up through the pulmonary artery, deoxygenated blood, and because the pressure from the lungs is preventing that blood from going to the lungs, it goes up into the ductus arteriosus and back through the left atrium and the left ventricle. That is a right to left shunt through the ductus. Very many of your babies in intensive care will have a left to right shunt through this ductus if it remains open. But that is where the ductus actually sits. The ductus, when it closes, it doesn't slam close. That doesn't happen. It actually closes after birth due to pressure. And it's because the lungs are inflating here. Yeah? And so we get these pressures which then start closing it. At about 24 hours, it's generally closed. If the blood pressures remain good, there's no problems. That ductus will slowly over six weeks become attendant and grow closed. If the child has got some form or some cardiac lesion, we may, oh, sorry, I don't mean to do this. We may need to give this child prostins to keep this ductus open. Respiration. I think very often we lose sight of what is happening with regards to it. So let's just run through it. This here is an alveoli. The little sac at the end in this lung, the sac where the actual oxygen exchange comes from. So there are a few concepts here that we need for everything to work properly. The first is we need a good blood pressure to keep this little capillary up against this alveoli. The second thing is we need this little alveoli to actually be inflated adequately so the gaseous exchange can come in. If there's too much pressure in here, it will flatten this area down here. If there's too little pressure, this will hang like a little grape and the two shall never meet. So gaseous exchange becomes difficult. The third is very important concept here is the actual surfactant lining. Now you all know that we actually give babies um, surfactant very often to line this area which facilitates this gaseous exchange. But if this blood pressure is too high, it will squash. If this blood pressure is too low, the two will never meet. If the pressure into here is too low, the two will never meet. Or if pressure very often because of the way we actually so-called bag these babies, we put in too much pressure here we're doing damage, we're doing harm, and we're not getting this gaseous exchange. Let's talk about the blood supply. Fetal hemoglobin is different to adult hemoglobin. Adult hemoglobin generally is, um, has a lifespan of 120 days. Fetal hemoglobin only lasts for 90 days. Babies have fetal hemoglobin. They sometimes have them for as long as six months. You can still see it on a slide. Every baby has a circulatory volume of 80 mils per kilogram. When you go back into your unit, take a 50 mil syringe and put 80 mils in a cup and look at it and know that that is all the blood a baby has that weighs a kilogram. And so taking blood all the time leads to these babies becoming hypovolemic because they cannot just produce blood at the drop of a hat. They have, it's actually on a kickback mechanism. Their own um, uh, bone marrow has to kick in for this to happen. Usually takes about six to eight weeks to happen. Lungs at term can utilize up to 50 mils of blood per kilogram at birth. 
that first breath and opening up that lung drops the blood pressure. When you give surfactant, it will drop the blood pressure because the lung is opening up. And so now blood is flooding into that area to actually start the oxygenation process. Therefore, it's important to remember that this is going to occur. Fetal hemoglobin has a high affinity to oxygen. And remember that the lungs have to grow fourfold from 29 weeks to 40 weeks. Any harm we have done along the way actually makes it hard for that baby to breathe at 40 weeks. So let's talk acidosis. The, you remember we discussed the whole idea that the baby sends its oxygen um, poor blood via the umbilical arteries to the placenta and there's an exchange there that happens. But there are actually three places where it can go wrong. With the mother, with the placenta, and with the baby. So the fetus is dependent on the mother via the placenta for oxygen and CO2 exchange till the minute that baby is born. This may be affected by the mother's own blood gas. So if the mother has pneumonia, COVID, um, HIV, um, asthma, that baby's um, blood, that baby's ABG will be affected while it's being carried by the mother. The uterine blood supply and the condition of the placenta is also important. If you have calcifications in that placenta, it is going to make the gaseous exchange difficult. Fetal gas transport could be a problem, and any of these will arise to to, to make an acidosis. The interesting thing, though, is, is that the fetus is actually developed to cope with a fair amount of acidosis. It's after it's born that it can't. So a significant and or prolonged hypoxia will influence your morbidity and your mortality. One of the biggest problems with acidosis or that contributes to the morbidity and mortality of acidosis is the temperature. A cold baby's acidosis is devastating. Acute acidosis really will lead to subsequent damage. So let's, what is acidosis? Acidosis is measured in pH. The blood pH changes much quicker than tissue pH. Most babies are born acidotic due to uterine contractions and the cutting off of the blood supply. And they are built to cope with that to a large extent. But we may have various problems. Is it maternal? Drugs, that sort of thing. Is it placental insufficiency or has it torn off? Or is there a problem with the baby? So very often babies are born acidotic and it's easily corrected with late cord clamping, warmth and oxygen. And this is what we've got to remember is that that, that is where acidosis comes from. So let's go back to what needs to happen. Hypoxia or insufficient blood supply will lead to a reduced cellular energy. If there isn't sufficient oxygen. If there isn't sufficient energy coming to that cell, that is going to cause cellular death. And ultimately, death is dependent on cellular death. So the cell needs glucose. It needs oxygen. It needs water. It needs to get rid of its CO2. And it needs energy. So let's look at blood gas levels. And uh, this article was published um, two days ago um, in PubMed, um, and you can go and read it, but it is very interesting, the harm that is done in the first three days of a baby's life if we do not control the oxygen levels very, very carefully. So when we look at a blood gas, <clears throat> we want our pH to be between 7.35 and 7.45. The PaCO2 we want between, so the partial, we want between 35 and 45 initially. 
CO2s, 50 to 70 or 45 to 65 in the preterm baby. So it's important that you remember that in the preterm baby, we will let this go further down. Bicarbs, 16 to 24 many moles per, des per litre, and the base excess, the base excess between minus two and plus two. So how do I look at a blood gas? When I look at a blood gas, and I'll show you after this slide how I do it, I look at it on two levels. I look at it from a lung, what is happening in lungs at the respiratory level, and what is happening at the kidney because the kidney controls acid base an abg or an arterial blood gas is generally done from an artery generally sort of brachial um you know they can be done from various places the only thing that you must remember is if you do a blood gas on a wrist best you do the allen's test before you do that what is an Allen's test? Is that you take your two fingers and you close off both arteries supplying the hand and you push hard enough, your hand should turn white. If you then lift one, your hand will pink up again. Allen's tests are very important because some individuals only have one artery feeding their hand. If that is happening, we should not be doing arterial blood gases at the wrist because you could get a clot and that could cut off the supply to that hand. So it's very important. Okay, so how do we do an arterial blood gas? So I've got two blood gases. I've got a blood gas here for you. And what I do is I divide my blood gas, the strip into two, I would draw a line there. And I would say that's up that way is respiratory and the down, so here, draw your line there, there. Up is the lung, down is the kidney. So the pH is 7.34, I'm happy with that. The PCO2 is 48. This is an, a baby not born today, it's a few days old, and we are quite happy to, in our unit, allow for permissible hypercapnia. 48 is okay. The PO2 is 76.5, it is fine. And in actual fact, according to the new guidelines, I may consider weaning the oxygen a tiny amount. The bicarb is 25 and the base X is 0.2. This looks like this baby is okay. There seems to be no problem. However, when I look at the electrolytes, look at my sodium and this, is significant because what it is telling me is that this baby is losing sodium somewhere. The glucose is fine. I, as a nurse, need to report this. Let's look at the next blood gas. The pH here is 7.41. And I'll say that's fine. The PCO2 is 44.4, that's fine. The PO2, however, is 54.4. This is a little bit of a problem. We need to take it up. This baby needs oxygen. The bicarbs are fine and the base excess is okay. So for this baby, the move would be move the oxygen up a little bit. That makes sense. Same baby, actually, because the sodium is now slowly climbing. However, Let's get to this blood gas. Again, draw your line, pH 7.28. It's coming down. This baby's becoming acidotic. PCO2 34, it's sitting, it's hovering, and the PO2 is okay. The bicarb is 16 now, and the base excess is minus nine. What is happening? What is happening? This baby is actually dehydrated because the base excess is very, very wide. If we were to make um, ventilatory changes, we wouldn't address the problem. 
we wouldn't address the problem. Also, the glucose is rising here. So it's telling us this baby is stressed. And I can promise you this heart rate is sitting above normal. So that is how we would look at um, a blood gas generally. Why is resuscitation important and why is mock resuscitation important or stimulation, um, simulated based resuscitation important? Guys, if you are not practicing a recess every week in your unit, and by means of saying practicing, it means doing a mock recess, not actually resuscitating, you will not be able to recess adequately when you have to recess. Because by doing mock recesses in a team, you learn to plan, you get teamwork, you learn to prepare, and when it actually happens, it is better. And there's improved documentation. The latest studies, and this was a meta-analysis done, doesn't show better outcomes, meaning morbidity and mortality, but it shows a better quality of resuscitation. And it is not acceptable to say, oh, we had a recess this week, we won't practice the recess. You have to practice every week. And the doctors and the nurses have to practice together. You have to have that huddle whereby everybody knows what they're doing and everybody says what they're doing. So if at 45 minutes, somebody says, I'm doing the glucose, I am putting on the SAT probe, you physically do that, even if you use a dolly that you have brought from home. But that is what needs to happen. Because see what the conclusion of this article says. It says simulated-based team training in neonatal recess improves team performance and technical performance in the simulated-based evaluations three to six months later. The current in is our, however, it, the current evidence is insufficient. So they are rearing towards the fact that it improves the outcome but you need to practice a mock recess. If you do not have an idea how to set up a mock resuscitation, you can send us an email and we can help you. But actually practicing a recess every week in your unit with a different team, everybody knows what they're supposed to do. So before the recess, you say, right, this is what you're going to do. Um, um, Tulani will run the recess. He will be the main person. Um, Sarah will be on 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 the air on on the airway. Um, um, Mohammed will be on breathing, and I will do the writing, and I will be helping with circulation. That is how it is meant to happen. Are there any questions? Thank you, Linda, for this excellent introduction to neonatal resuscitation. I think we already have covered quite a few very important topics. So for those of you who are online and have questions, please type in your questions in the question box. So far, we haven't received any questions, and I hope it's because uh, everything is clear and that Linda is doing an excellent job, not because you cannot find the question box. So we're going to wait for um, a few more moments in case if there are any questions that do pop up. Um, and we can take uh, a six minute break. So uh, now it's 54 minutes to an hour and we will back exactly at zero zero so i'm not going to say each hour because we have uh, different time zones but please come back online or stay online and we're back in six minutes and in the meantime okay we have some questions coming in um excellent um so there is a question uh blood pressure can monitor in can can monitor in lower legs in preterm or term babies. So can we monitor blood pressure in lower legs in preterm or term babies? 
Yes, we can monitor the blood pressure in the lower limbs. We just have to ensure, and we covered that in last month's webinar, that the blood pressure cuff is two thirds of the size of that part of the limb. So if you're using the lower limb, you would put it between the knee and the ankle and the blood pressure cuff needs to be two thirds of the size of the length between the knee and the ankle. So yes, you can measure on the lower limb. There is no reason why not, unless the lower limbs have got poor circulation, obviously. Thank you, Linda. Another question, at which age uh, uh, max ductus arterius is closed? At which age maximum? I mean, what's the latest, so to say? Well, there are people that um, will present much later in life. I've seen a man at 45 present with respiratory distress and the diagnosis is a patent ductus arteriosus. But in normal babies, by six weeks, the ductus has closed. In most instances, week one, the ductus is closed. It is just in the micro prem where we have, and the premie, often we have variations in blood pressure and that doesn't allow for that ductus to remain closed. It will, because of pressures, open up. But also, if you were to give a drug called prostaglandin or P, uh, uh, prostaglandin or E2, it's called, that will try and open the ductus if, for instance, you have a cardiac lesion that you need to move the baby. So it can remain in, in premies. And in, as we often use drugs to close it, to just make it easier, but it generally is closed in premature infants between a month and six weeks quite easily. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, there's another question uh, regarding the right to left shunt. Is it through the ductus arteriosus or the foramen ovale? It can happen between both. The, uh, the foramen ovale, generally in term babies, should be closed. However, um, in, in um, the premie, they are usually, um, they, can, they can be opened. The foramen ovale, if the um, cardiologists scan them, it would be what we call um, a, a ASD, and, or they usually term it as an ASD. They'll say there's an anterior, uh, atrial septal defect, meaning that the ovale is open. But generally, uh, there is quite a bit of shunt across both, but the cardiac one closes quite quickly um, at birth. So generally, the shunt happens in the PDA, and that's where the ligation would occur as well. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. There are a few questions from a few people with regards to the last month's webinar and the webinar recordings and the presentation. So all of these materials are available and they will be made available to you after the webinar. And we will make sure that we will include the link to the first webinar. It's a YouTube link, it's already uploaded on YouTube. So you will be able to review the first webinar as well. Um, okay, so another question. For neonates, how much um, uh, crystalloid can we give before considering a colloid? <laughs> I was hoping this question wasn't going to arise because I can't seem to find um, the proper answer. But I would quite easily reckon that I wouldn't go past 40, 40 moles per kilogram. So two doses in a 24 hour period before I would look at Christ, before I would look at, at colloid. Because preemies tend to be born in high output failure anyway, and they become very swollen very, very quickly. Um, we do know from the work done in adult resuscitation, especially in the trauma field, that um, Oedema contributes to mortality and morbidity, and anecdotally, I'm sure we can all attest to that. Excellent, thank you. Um, another interesting question. Thanks for the nice presentation, but I need more clarification on how um, how does much excess of fluid lead to DIC, especially uh, to a newborn who have hemorrhagic shock. So. 
in a nutshell, um, you can go and look at the work done um, with regards to um, multiple transfusions. Um, in South Africa, there is now almost a standardized policy with regards to resuscitating adults. Um, and your DIC, which for those of you who don't know, is disseminated intracleopathy, will occur usually after about three units of blood has been transfused into an adult patient. We start seeing thrombolytic changes happening on, on, on your um, in, in, in circulation. In babies, um, we tend to see it uh, similarly, if we've had to use um, sort of three lots of transfusions of blood, um, but remembering that we also have hemolytic newborn disease, um, or if a baby was born where they have basically bled out for some reason, those babies, the transfusion would have to occur very carefully. Um, and um, we could look for an article for you if you so wish. Um, at the end of my part of this lecture, I will give you um, my Facebook page and my, the Twitter account, and you can um, leave messages there for me and I will find you an article. Thank you, Linda. Um, another question, what can a four lymph uh, BP and SPO2 Tell me, uh, tell us about a neonate. A four lead? Yes. Um, generally, we would only use a three lead um, ECG. Generally, um, we did cover it last week. Your most important part of looking here is that your heart rate, what is your heart rate doing? What is your SpO2 doing? And those two things would tell you an incredible amount of your circulatory volume. Um, one, if we, um, let me just see if I can return back um, quickly. Let me take you back and just, no, this is taking me forward now. Um, when we, let me just see if I can quickly, um, when we come back after the break, I will quickly explain to you how it happens. Um, it has to do with the pressure of the, um, uh, it has to do with the capillary pressure. Let's just, there we go. Okay. Let's just go back here and I'll quickly explain it to you. So the most important part of, of what happens to your um, hemodynamics is, is is so let's just pretend let's just pretend here that this is um, an organ well it is this is the lung for instance up against the capillary bed if we've got problems with the blood pressure so the baby's bled out we will battle to maintain this and gaseous exchange won't happen. On the kidney level, we won't have the fluid changing. So this is what you've got to remember, is that you need this area here to work, that you've got organ perfusion. This is what we call organ perfusion. So we've got the right pressure here, the right pressure here, and whatever the organ is designed to do, it can do its work. That's why your, your hemodynamics are so important because if your blood pressure is not working, if your mean blood pressure isn't sufficient, you are not going to get gaseous exchange here. If your mean blood pressure is too high, it's going to squash this and it is going to not allow the gaseous exchange to happen. So it is very important that your heart rate and your saturations, your, your heart rate, will tell you a lot about your blood pressure. Your saturations will tell you what's happening here. And that is why it's so important that you watch these babies very carefully. Okay, thank you, Linda. I think we're gonna take a few more questions before we proceed to the break. And then after the second part of the lecture, we can continue with the lectures. We have quite a few questions and we'll try to answer 
most of them. And if we don't have time for something, we will get back to you uh, directly. So, um, so there is an interesting question, how can we win temperature in preterm uh, with high temperatures? But I think when it comes to thermoregulation, we're going to be covering this in the later modules. Um, no, Linda? Yes, we are. But if the baby's overheated, because the skin is so thin, the baby will dehydrate fairly quickly. That's why the humidification that Margarita did so well in last month's um, webinar is so important in them. Um, also, if the baby becomes hypothermic or hyperthermic, its need for oxygen and its need for energy, i.e. glucose, rises, and that stresses out the body. So both instances, so to have what we call um, a normal thermal environment is very important for that baby. Remember that a one kilogram baby wants a different temperature to a three or a four kilogram baby. So your, your, your neutral thermal environment becomes very important because it puts the least stress on oxygen and glucose. Excellent, thank you, Linda. I think um, we can take now a four minute break. So we are a little bit obviously delayed from, but we've got quite a few questions which I'm quite happy that we are able to answer. So let's take a four minute break um, and we're back here at 10 past the hour of your time zone. So please stay online, don't go anywhere. When we look at resuscitation, I think it's very important that we remember that, and these stats are from 2009, so they've probably adjusted, but the, the ratios will remain the same. So worldwide, 136 million babies are born per year, and they are assessed and get simple care. Of that 136 million, approximately 10 million will need the initial steps, such as drying, warmth, clearing the airway and stimulation. Those babies will then have tart and go off to their mothers. The next uh, group of babies, approximately 6 million, will need to be ventilated. This doesn't mean that they need to go on a ventilator. All it means is that they will need to be assisted to breathe initially and they will do well. About 1.4 million babies worldwide only require resuscitation. That is a very small number from what we see up there. And a lot of resuscitation is actually being, as I said before, very clear, concise, calm, and caring, and very gentle in your resuscitation. So what are the key behavior skills that we need? Firstly, we need to know our environment. You need to be very comfortable in that environment. You need to anticipate and plan. That huddle that I spoke about last month, whereby you decide who is going to do what, who's doing which allocation, what are we expecting? Because every recess is different. I mean, if a baby is born in a car outside in your emergency department, that's a very different resuscitation to a mother who's had a long labor, who's had an excessive amount of medication or drugs and is now tired and the baby's tired. So planning that recess is very important. And planning and, and practicing situations such as the birth in a car outside or arriving, a cold baby arriving there because it was born on a taxi coming into your hospital. Those are the resources that you should be practicing. Allocate leadership to an appropriate person. This may not mean that it needs to be the senior person. It may need to be a person who actually has the ability to do a resource very well and remain calm. Communicate effectively and quietly Generally in a recess, only one person speaks and the others speak when spoken to. And if you've got an issue or you want to fight about it, 
button up. Wait till the recess is finished and you have a debrief and then pass the comment. But please don't start a major argy-bargy right there. Delegate the workload, know what needs to happen. Ensure all staff are in the present. You cannot now be deciding that you want to know what's for lunch. You've got to be there and present. Utilize your information, know your equipment, know who you can call for help, and always, always consider the parents. Tell them what will happen. Nothing shocks a parent more than when there's a big recess and everybody's going mad and everybody's cunning un is what we would say in South Africa. And the parents have no idea. It looks scary. It is scary, but nobody can interpret it for them. So somebody like the anaesthetist may need to step up and say to the mom and dad, in a cesarean section, they are resuscitating, it looks okay, this is what's happening, so the parents are aware. Hand washing and use of spray saves far more lives than resuscitation. There is no reason for us not to sanitize prior to a recess. You need your gloves and you need to sanitize, and it needs to be practiced every day and COVID has taught us this and we need to continue this. The thermal process, as we discussed earlier, this is where the baby loses its blood pressure, uh, its, its temperature and this is often where it starts going pear-shaped. This is just to remind you what we discussed last month about conduction, convection, radiation and evaporation. It is important that the minute that baby is born, it is either placed inside a plastic bag up to its neck. Please don't put the whole baby in the bag. It receives a hat. It is wrapped warmly. And the resuscitation happens with as much of the baby as covered as possible. Also that your equipment is working. Is the resuscitator or the over, overhead heater working? Is it working properly? Are our probes put on correctly? It is very important because remember, neutral thermal environment means the baby is using the least oxygen and the least glucose to sustain life. What equipment do we need? We need a blanket, a hat, a roll, and I'll show you that just now stethoscopes, suction, make sure it's working, a bag, a bag valve resuscitator, oxygen, make sure it's working, syringes, needles, feeding tubes, suction catheters, fluids, documentation, very, very important, warming devices, drugs, cord clamp, um, saturation, monitor and a timer. All of these are important. This list you can take, copy, utilize as you wish. Again, oh, okay. So you need to know your environment, anticipate and plan, allocate, communicate, delegate, ensure all the staff are there, utilize the information, and call for help if necessary and make the parents part of it. This is the algorithm currently. This is a South African one. It is available to you if you pop us a message and we will um, allow it or you can just go on to um, the South African Resource Council site and you can download it for yourself. These need to be put up everywhere close to a bed where a recess may occur so that staff can refer to it all the time. You will see here that it gives you oxygen administration, it gives you the pre-ductal sets as we've discussed, as well as post-resuscitation care. And this can just be downloaded, laminated and put up against a wall if you so wish. Again, we get to the APGAR. 
we've gone through this before. So the respiration, the reflexes, the pulse or heart rate, depending on what you call it, skin color and muscle tone. This is called a bag valve resuscitator. And I have to spend some time on this because there are there is so much confusion with regards to how this is used, how it is put together, and what people do that it is quite scary. So the first thing that we need to know is does this mask, is it appropriate for the face that we are going to have? You will need three sizes at your recess area. There is a little one-way valve here that needs to be put in in the correct way. It is absolutely essential that you understand how that wor valve works. It is a one-way valve for a reason. It's called the expiratory valve. It means that it prevents vomit from coming up there and entering your bag. There's your peep valve or your pop-off valve. Very often when I enter into recesses, I hear this burp, burp as people are bagging. If you hear this pop-off valve making a noise while you're bagging, you are doing harm because it is far too hard. This should not happen. This bag needs to be filled with oxygen and for this to work properly, we actually need the reservoir bag. And the reservoir bag needs not to be filled to full capacity, but it needs to be filled. Because when you press down here, air moves from here down into the baby through that valve, but air will be sucked in as well. So you cannot not have this here. Many hospitals, often have lost this part and then they put a long piece of what's called elephant tubing on there. Yes, it is acceptable, but it is very important that you understand how this works. You can also not just put this at the baby's face and hope it is going to work because this valve has to be open for the oxygen to reach the neonate. So you need to have a certain amount of pressure on here, even if it's at the baby's face, for the baby to receive oxygen. Now, let's talk about this here. Most people will use their entire hand to actually move this bag. It is wrong. You need to only use two, at the most, three fingers to move this bag. Resuscitation and prevention of bronchopulmonary dysplasia depends on how gently you resuscitate initially. You cannot push this down on the baby's face. The baby's face needs to come into the mask, not the mask into the baby's face. And you need to only use, assume that every finger is 10 centimeters of water pressure. We do not ventilate babies over a pressure of 30. So we should not be using more than two fingers to move it. When we look at the bag, we cannot actually use an adult bag to resuscitate an infant. Look at this adult bag and how many liters of oxygen it requires versus this bag here. Look at the capacity. This, this part here is this part here. This part here is this part here. You cannot be using these huge big bags here for this. And do not assume that this face mask is going to fit. The big one is going to fit a preemie. It won't. So your chest rise is your most reliable sign regarding to ventilation. The heart rate usually returns with good ventilation. If you do not have an infant bag valve resuscitator, please be aware of overinflation. If you overinflate that lung, you're going to do a lot of harm. 
So you want the lowest flow and the lowest pressure necessary to move the oxygen into that baby to prevent BPD. Now, there are a few concepts here that are important. The mask needs to be correct. The head needs to be in the neutral position, and we'll discuss that now. We need to maintain the baby's warmth. This baby's not going to be, stay warm. Look how open it is. And remember what I said. So if you see here, they're using the E, C method. When they bag this baby, they are going to clamp their fingers under the chin here. They are bringing the baby's face into the mask, not pushing the mask into the baby's face. There is a new tendency to utilize nasal cannula during resuscitation. It has been used fairly successfully. Um, I am not completely sure that it's the way to go, but you can try. This is the shoulder roll. It is important that the shoulder roll is in place for you to resuscitate. Look at the way this baby's lying here versus lying here. This airway is open, this airway is collapsing. And how have they done it? Please notice the shoulder roll. There's actually two here if you look carefully. There's this one and that one. And that puts the baby's face into the neutral position or what we call sniffing the morning breeze. Do not overextend it, just put it in. And that will allow for decent lung elevation. This baby is actually being overextended. That head needs to come a little bit down. Can you see the EC method? So they're lifting the chin with their three lower fingers. So if you hold, it's usually your right hand, your thumb and your thumb and um, forefinger will be holding the mask, and the three other fingers are doing the E. So you hook and bring the face into the mask. Very often round masks are actually easier for people who don't do this often. But the more you practice, the better you'll get at it. Again, we're talking about the, the EC method. There's the E, three, chin, C, clamping, this here. And that's what you're going to do. Look how they've placed the equipment. They've got the laryngoscope, they've got an airway, they've got a stethoscope, and they can suction. Okay, so it's very, very important that you know that that is what you need to do. Now, let's go through the algorithm. It talks here about the golden minute in 60 seconds. So up to here, this is what we're going to do. And 60 seconds is actually quite a long time. People do not use clocks sufficiently. So what does it say? It says, is the baby turned? Is the baby breathing? Is there good tone? Get the baby warm, clear the airway if necessary, dry and stimulate the baby. If it's younger than 30 weeks, place it in a plastic bag and wrap it warmly so that it stays warm. Assess your breathing and crying and your heart rate. If there's ongoing re, um, respiratory distress, at this stage, the doctor will make a call about CPAP. If it's gasping, apnea, or the heart rate is less than 100, you start ventilating with room air for a term baby, using the oxygen for the preterm baby at 30%, not 100%. So you do need a blender but it won't always work because not many hospitals in rural areas have blenders, but then look at setting the literage a little bit lower. Connect to the pulse oximeter where possible to avoid hypooxemia. So you do not want to overuse your oxygen and ensure that there is a chest rise with every breath. That takes place in a minute. 
Next, we assess breathing, heart rate, the color. Every 30 to 60 minutes, if the heart rate is above 100, we'll just assess the baby. If it's below 100, we can now consider to ventilate the baby with supplied oxygen. We assess the breathing, the heart rate, and the color. If the heart rate in the prem drops below 80 or in the term baby below 60, you have to start chest compressions. At this stage, it will be three compressions to one breath. Assess the breathing, the heart rate, and remember that at one minute, you're going to give an APGAR, at five minutes, you're going to give an APGAR, and at 10 minutes. It is only at about minute four that you will consider giving adrenaline, okay? And correcting hypovolemia if you have to. So in the first 30 seconds, we are going to start the clock we're going to provide warmth. We're going to clear the airway. We're going to dry the baby. Notice how they've covered this baby so that it's got a hat and most of its abdomen is covered. This baby really doesn't require much resuscitation. If the baby's under 30 weeks, we're going to put it in a bag to keep it warm. We're going to assess breathing and heart rate, we will start ventilation in room air if it's term, we'll use 30% if it's premature, check the chest rise, connect the SAT monitor and do a blood glucose. If this baby needs Narcan, Nalisolone to reverse the drug effects, it needs to be given now. If it's got a low glucose, that needs to be treated. And maybe you must, and remember to try and put the saturation probe on the right hand. So, Mr. Sofa, M stands for adjust the mask, adjust the mask, which means face into mask, not mask into face, because if you put mask into face, you're going to collapse the airway reposition the head make sure you've got that roll make sure that that airway is open suction the mouth and then the nose open the mouth ensure the jaw, the jaw thrust so make sure that you've got it got it gradually increase the pressure and consider an advanced airway please remember that babies are nasal breathers if you have an co-anal issue, if there, there's a membrane or that nose hasn't developed, the baby cannot breathe if you do not put in an advanced airway. So at one minute, preductally, you want 60. Two minutes, 65. Three minutes, 70. 75, 80, and 90. Remember what I said. The baby is built to deal with the acidosis. You do not need to go from A60 to 90 in two minutes. There is time. Slow, careful, calm resuscitation. Not everybody yelling, screaming, and big issues going. From 60 to 120 seconds, you are going to check the chest drives, check the heart rate, start chest compressions in the premie if it's below 80. Start with compressions, three compressions to one breath. Every cycle should take two seconds. Count out loud. There's a reason for that. Everybody now knows there's a resuscitation. Everybody is giving attention. People know what's happening. We know where we are and we, the person that is doing the bagging can anticipate when they need to give the breath. If the heart rate's above 80 breaths, only assist, with, only assist with ventilation. Stay calm and now between 60 and 120 minutes, you will prepare for airway stabilization. So what are you going to do? You're going to assess breathing and you're going to do this every 30 to 60 minutes. 
Ventilate with supplemented oxygen at 30%. In a prem baby, if the heart rate is above 100. If in the term baby, by now it's not going up, you will put up the oxygen to 30. Assess the breathing, assess the heart rate, assess the saturation. If the heart rate is fairly normal, above 100, the baby's extremity might be cold and that will give you a poorer saturation. Just check, 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 check. Start CPR if the heart rate in the term is below 60, 80 in the preemie and continue ventilation. Now only will you consider intubation. In the um, term babies, you can even consider a, a LMA, a laryngeo mask. Look at your hand placement. Please guys, it's very important that in the term baby, this method is far more successful. In the prem baby, this method works. But in the term baby, very often, we don't get decent chest compressions if we don't use this method. So what happens in a chest when we're doing CPR? And I think this is where it becomes very, very important to remember. That when you are resuscitating and you're putting pressure on the chest, the lung sits there, the heart sits there. So when you press down, you are actively emptying the lung, emptying the heart. The blood now goes to the lung, goes to the brain, goes where it needs to go, essential organs. When you lift your hands, the blood will passively stream back into the heart and air will go into the lung. So it doesn't help to go all hammers and tongs pushing up and down and it's not in two seconds because if you go too fast, the heart cannot fill. If you go too slow, then the problem is that the blood is not getting to the brain. So it has to be measured. And that is part of the mock resuscitation, which makes it important because you have to get into a rhythm. One, two, three, breathe. 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 30 seconds. Assess. Let's go. One, two, three, breathe. One, two, three, breathe. One, two, three, breathe. Now, the reset, the person can say, what is the saturation? What is the glucose? What is happening? When the lungs are compressed, as I said, it empties. The lungs will fill. So the minute that that hand lifts and, and even just the oxygen will stream in, filling. The heart fills as the chest wall rises. Remember that there are muscles between, so you've got the chest wall and the lungs are attached to the chest wall. So when the hands lift, the, 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 the chest wall will rise, it will expand the lung, that's important. The heart fills as the chest wall rises and the depth and the rhythm is important. Those are the most important things that happen. Don't try and we all get shocked and we're all running around trying to sort it out. The more you practice, the more controlled this recess will be, the more successful you should be. At 120 to, to 180 minutes, the chest, check the chest rise again. That's the most important. Check the heart rate. Carry on with your CPR if the heart is not above 80. Carry on with your compressions, count out loud, stay calm and use the least traumatic measure to intubate. Do not spend time intubating. If you don't get in, put the mask back and reinflate the baby. And now you can look at placing the IV therapy. So how do we do it? As I said, three compressions, one breath. Three compressions, one breath. The person doing the compressions counts. One, two, three, 
The person doing the breath now says breath. One, two, three, breath. One, two, three, breath. One, two, three, breath. One, two, three, breath. Always check. I cannot tell you how many times in a resuscitation, often the failure is in these checks. Check the oxygen connection and the flow is happening. Very often in running around trying to move, people have bumped the, the connection off the oxygen and it needs to be reapplied. Check the neck roll position and the chin lift. If it's a new person bagging and doing the breath, ensure that they understand how the EC chest lift happens so they know. And if you've got to correct it, don't shout and say, no, you're doing that wrong. Gently just take the hand, fix it, and let it happen. Check the monitor attachments. Very often people go, there's no saturation. And then the sac probes come off. Keep the baby covered and warm. Check the color and record, 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 record. Somebody must because you will not always remember it. It can be on the back of a gauze swab um, packaging. It can be on a piece of scrap paper. And then when you have finished and documented your recess, attach that piece of paper to the documentation. Because in a year's time, when somebody says, what happened here, you're not going to remember. But many a time, I've looked back at what I've written and I've suddenly remembered, oh, that happened. Oh, that's why I put that there. And then you will recall. So please make sure that you record, record, record. At 180 to 240 seconds, you are going to check the chest rise, check the equipment, check the heart rate. You go through this over and over and over. And now you're going to consider adrenaline. You will not use atropine in a resuscitation. If you do, expect to see NEC in 48 hours time because that's the side effect of atropine. It clears the gut of all its blood and 48 hours later, there is NEC. It is not part of the international guidelines, the ILCOR guidelines. It is not part of any guideline to use atropine. It should not be used. Soda bicarb, soda bic, is also no longer utilized in a resuscitation because it has been found to be detrimental. The only drug suggested is something like naloxone to reverse the um, opiate problem and adrenaline. And adrenaline is truly only used for its inotropic effect. So you are going to mix one mil of one into 10,000 units into nine mils of water, and then you use the 0.1 to 0.3 mils per kilogram of that dilution to give to the baby. Now we are also going to come up with 120 ideas because some people want to give it down the ET tube, not shown to work as well as getting it through a line. But if you don't have a line up, then I suppose that's where you've got to go. But remember that adrenaline has a very short half-life. So getting the baby stabilized is very important. The half-life for adrenaline is probably two minutes. So make sure that you know what you're doing and that the adrenaline is given properly and checked. It is usually only given by minute four. From 20, 240 to 300 seconds, if there's no chest rise, you should have by now considered that there's a pneumothorax. You check the heart rate again, you count out loud, you repeat your APGAR, and you can repeat your adrenaline. You cannot just give adrenaline and adrenaline and adrenaline and not sort out the hypovolemia or not sort out the problem. or, or, or it, It's not going to work forever. So it's important that you know exactly what you're doing. 
go through the algorithm again start at the top and work your way through post resuscitation it's important to in these babies unless there was a massive h they haven't got hie so they came back quite quickly there's no problem it wasn't a long recess within five minutes we've sorted it out we maintain normothermic status consider a hypothermic hypothermic um, therapy in term babies and we will be covering that much later um, i think it's possibly close to october if a baby continues with respiratory distress now you can consider giving this baby it's a fact and putting it on cpap right there in the unit and maintain the saturations above 90 to 95 the um, saturations and wean the oxygen if necessary. Now we get to the new part of what we want done in the world of neonatology. So resuscitation is seen as the act or an instance of restoring somebody to an active or flourishing state. We are now seeing something called the delivery room cuddle. And this is going to put the cat amongst the pigeons. Because in most instances, what's happened now is that we've got the airway in and the baby's okay. And now, of course, the drama for neonatology begins because now we whip the baby off and we fly down the corridor to the neonatal unit, fly through the doors, everybody's running around and everybody is as happy as Larry because now our adrenaline's pumping and we are feeling great. And what have we left behind? Two devastated people whose baby has now been whipped away. What have we taken into the neonatal unit? A baby who has never, ever heard, seen, felt much. All it has known is its mother's heart rate, its mother's um, abdominal sounds, its mother's voice, its mother's smell, and its mother's touch. And now we fly it into intensive care. The latest work coming out of Britain now says that the baby, once it's stabilized, should go back to the mother. Yes, it's wrapped in blankets. Yes, it's in everything else, but it should be placed back on the chest of the mother so that both the mother and the baby can regulate and just come to a point by which they are able to catch their breaths. You as neonatal staff can stand there and watch, even if the baby's intubated, on the Drago resuscitator, you are able to actually ventilate that baby and allow those parents five to 10 minutes just to breathe. This may be the only chance they have of holding this baby for as long as sometimes six weeks. That five or 10 minutes it takes out of your day makes the world of difference. But the other secret is that five or 10 minutes actually buys you time because that baby regulates, gets control, and now almost starts stabilizing on its mother. So we really have to rethink how we end the golden hour. It is no longer acceptable to rush this baby off. So if you have come to your five minutes here and your APGAR is seven and everything is okay. Wrap that baby, get it warm. Even if it's got its, its, its ET tube in, give it one or two minutes to stabilize. Push the resuscitator up to the mother and put this baby on the chest. It is not going to be up yet. Because mom breeds, baby breeds, mom breeds, baby breeds. And give that baby its time to pull itself towards itself. 
allow mom or dad or both time to cuddle. Any baby, irrespective of its gestational age, who has that APGAR should return to mom for that little bit of skin to skin. We know that in England, they have done this successfully with even 22 weekers. It can be done. It is a skill that skilled people can give the parent that chance. Baby is stabilized on CPAP or ventilation. The vent the, if there is an ET tube in place, it can be secured. The baby is wrapped warmly and placed back to mom and or dad for a cuddle. Medical and nursing staff stay on hand, maintaining stability, allowing for baby to regulate, stabilize, and adjust. Moms, smell, voice, and skin all help with this. Believe it or not, this will help with milk, mum's milk production. Babies are far less hypoglycemic and hypothermic, the study shows. And we are now starting to hear about reduced neonatal PTSD and perinatal depression because these mothers have had the opportunity to hold this baby. So it is all about bringing the NICU room to the delivery suite or to the theater. This is very foreign to all of you. The work done is, is by um, two doctors called Dr. Paul Clark and Dr. Paul Cowley. We have approached them and they have tentatively given us a date to talk on both the golden hour and on um, uh, um, the, the delivery room cuddle for us on the 29th of um, April. Um, Margarita and I will keep, we will keep in contact. And as soon as we've got confirmation, we will put it on the website and you can invite your doctors to attend the evening. It will only be a 90 minute session. Um, and if you will be able to attend it as well, they both are very, very good speakers. And um, a lot of what needs to be clarified can be given at this stage. These are the words that you should have understood, cord clamping, respiration, ABG, ECGs, you know about TART, so if there are any questions, just put them in the box. We're going into questions now. I have left um, suggested reading for you here. One of these articles is, is actually the article written by Dr. Clark and Dr. Cowley um, from Norwich. Um, there are the um, various people you can follow on Twitter that very often talk about resuscitation. And the um, first address is my Facebook page. And at Prematurity um, I is actually the South African Draga Stroke Little Miracle um, Twitter page, which we often Twitter on. Um, Marguerite, I think, Marguerite, we can go to questions. Thank you very much, Linda, for this um, very nice lecture, very emotional ending. I think you have addressed all of the extremely important topics, um, especially the topic of uh, cuddles and the labor and delivery and overall mother and child bonding in the NICU. I think it's extremely important. And uh, we will be talking about those topics in the later webinars in the context of developmental care and uh, family-centered care. So Linda, thank you so much for this excellent lecture. We have a lot of questions, so we will now, and for those of you who have questions, please type them in. Uh, we still have quite some topics to cover, so we're gonna continue with the uh, questions now. Um, good morning. What are the acceptable values for blood pressure for the different gestational ages? Okay, so we did cover that last week, but um, uh, last month, but I will give you the rule of thumb. 
So it's gestational age plus two, that is the mean blood pressure. In neonates, it is best to work on mean blood pressure, which is gestational age plus two. Excellent. Um, I think if there's a similar question, what are the target values when measuring post-maturation as CO2 and the comparative value with your blood gas analysis? So you always want your piece, your PO, your, your saturations to run between 88 and 94 in, in the newborn um, version or in the neonatal part of it. When we're talking infants that have gone home, we prefer their saturations to be above 94. But before they go home, we would like the blood, the, the saturations to, to be at 94. I always say to the staff, if you see a blood uh, uh, saturation above 94, wean the oxygen. Obviously, if the baby's well and regulated, it can breathe at 100%. But if it's on oxygen, try and wean the oxygen. Excellent. Um, another question. Um, can Linda please repeat the correlation between base excess and dehydration? Okay, so your base excess tells you about what your dehydration is. You want your base excess to be minus two to plus two. It sits in that range. Anything sort of, I don't worry about minus five, but anything further than minus five, that tells you that there's a dehydration problem. You can, if Lasix has been given, furosemide you will often see a base excess of about minus four, but generally you can pick it up in the rest of the blood gas in that the child will be metabolically alkalotic. Remember metabolic alkalosis is due to medication. So stuff like um, targets, um, any of the um, gastric sort of things, um, Lasix does it as well. So remember that you be aware of that. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question, can we use defibrillator on neonates or not? <laughs> I don't like using a defibrillator on a neonate. It's very rare that you have to. You are far better at using adenosine. Just remember that when you do use adenosine, that you have to do what we call a chase. So if you generally have to use a defibrillator or um, adenosine, you usually have a port of entry anyway. And what you would do is you would give the adenosine and then chase it with at least two moles or three moles of water so that it can get in the system. What happens with adenosine is you will give it Sometimes the dose generally initially doesn't work. What it will do is it will take that heart rate um, down, uh, but it, the heart will go up again. It will go da 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 da. But when you've given adenosine in a sufficient dose, what it will do is it will the heart rate will go da 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 da. Stop. Count five. One, two, three, four, five before you put your hands to chest again, because you are more than likely to see that what will happen is that the baby's heart rate will come back. But remember, and the person who's asking this question is assuming this is a cardiac arrest, the neonatal arrest is generally only a respiratory arrest. If you have to use a defibrillator, the chances of getting that baby back is very, very rare. You will use adenosine for a, 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 a SVT only. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. There's another question about the 12 leads ECG and whether it's done or used in babies. What is the use for cardiac congenital diagnosis or cardiac problems? Yes, it is used only really for cardiac congenital disease. It is very difficult to place a 12 lead ECG on even a two kilogram baby. 
and actually there's generally always only one or two people in the unit that are skilled enough to place all um, the leads in the correct place but it is used for cardiac lesions generally before that you will be asked to do a four limb blood pressure um, and that will also be used with the ECG with the 12 lead ECG, but a 12 lead ECG is only generally used for cardiac lesions. Remembering that most of your cardiac lesions tend to only present hours later. It is the hyperplastic left lung that will present immediately. Excellent, thank you. Um, there is another very interesting question. Can you explain why neonatal dose of adrenaline has a maximum range uh, up to 0.3 milliliters per kilogram that exceeds the dose for pediatrics uh, or 0.1 um, for pits? Yeah, there is a reason why it does it, is that the um, actual Remember what I said to you about the renal function of these babies, they are often in high, high output failure. So the higher dose tends to be sort of more effective in these babies for some reason, but it, it has to do with that. The half-life clearance is, is quite quick. And for that reason, that's why it is like that. A lot of people, when they get to the point where they use adrenaline, will actually use too much adrenaline. So be very careful um, and very aware of it because once it's worked out, if it's a non-starter baby, you won't have much effect. Excellent, thank you so much, Linda. Um, the next question is, can I clarify that the algorithm of NRP for the uh, CPR initiated is below 60 breaths per minute or 80 breaths per minute? As on the slides, it was written below 80 breaths per minute. So, so remember, term baby, 60. Prem baby, 80. Remember that last year, last week, we discussed, or last month, we discussed that the the term, the, 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 the heart, even at term, is not a true muscle, it's a tendon. If we leave the prem baby to go lower than 60, the harm that has already been done in the brain is quite extensive. So at 80, it is better for that baby because the term baby's heart rate usually runs between 140 and about 100 beats per minute. But the prem baby's heart rate generally runs between 140 and 180 beats per minute. So if you allow it to go further down, that baby, you will, you will reach a point of no return, if that makes sense. So it's better to start the CPR at 80 breaths per minute on the prem baby. Excellent. Thank you for clarification. Um, so another question on the post-resuscitation. Um, uh, basically, regarding placing the post-resuscitation very preterm baby skin to skin, do take the baby out of the bag and then replace them for transfer. So basically, how do you um, uh, how do you optimize the workflow post-resuscitation in between the cuddles and for transportation? So don't package that baby. The word we use is package. Package that baby as though you're going to transfer it and then give it to the mother. The voice, her touch, her smell will already do a lot more for that baby. So don't take it out the plastic bag. Don't try and put it there skin to skin. And remember that the first time when you guys try this, the most skilled people must be at that resuscitation because you've got to be very secure in doing this to be able to do it. As time goes along, everybody learns to do it. But initially, it's sort of the senior staff that try it. Keep the baby in its blankets, keep it wrapped up, but give it to the mother. The, the, the baby's sense of smell, um, babies at this age work off their Jacobson organ. And now it's going to sound horrendous because a lot of you are going to go, oh, 
because the Jacobson organ is actually what a snake finds its um, prey on, what a bird finds its food on. But the Jacobson organ is highly, highly sensitive at this age. A mother, anybody who's been pregnant knows how sensitive you are to smell. So a mother it has a heightened smell. The baby has a heightened smell. Just the smell, the voice and the touch already will help regulate that baby. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. Um, there's another question. If a baby was stable and all check up done with no problem, after one or two hours, the parents notice high respiration. What do you think would be or can be the cause of that? So there's two reasons for that. Um, if the baby has had that, that could be a cardiac lesion starting to present. Or the other reason is that the baby actually is going to present with some form of sepsis. Um, very often um, you will see your groupie streps present sort of from six hours to 48 hours. Um, those are all things that, that sort of happen. And a low glucose can do that. Um, that it, the baby's working harder because it doesn't have sufficient glucose. Because remember what Norma or, or your, your therapeutic environment means, lowest oxygen use, lowest glucose use. But if you don't have glucose, then the, you will see things happening. So then you start at the basics, exclude and work your way up. Thank you for this comment, Linda. Um, I'm not sure if the next question is more of a statement or a question, but um, Maybe you can comment on that. Um, dehydration can rule out with the chloride levels. Yes, you can look at your chloride levels, but very often if you look at your base excess in many units, they don't actually have a blood gas machine that will give you chloride levels. Um, and most of that, that would come from somebody who's in what we would call a level one hospital because they've got access to a lot more, but very basic blood gas machines will also tell that. So yes, I, I will accept that. Yes, of course. But for many nurses, the base excess is actually an easier way to work it and then to check the chlorine levels. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, next question, with regards to a resuscitation when the heart rate is okay and you only doing mask ventilation, how do you time the amount of rescue breaths that are given? So remember what the baby would breathe at. Generally, you would breathe for the baby between 40 and 60 breaths per minute. But give the baby a chance. So every 30 seconds, check if the baby's not going to breathe by itself. So just keep the bag open that valve I explained to you, and allow the baby to breathe and observe how it's breathing. So look at auxiliary muscle use. Look at what the baby's doing, because at that stage, you may get away with putting on nasal cannula only. Excellent. Thank you. Um, great. We have received a uh, clarification on one of the earlier questions. Apparently, there was a type. So uh, basically, um, the question is about the use of blood pressure and oxygen saturation on all four limbs uh, of the neonate, so both arms and both legs. If there is a discrepancy between these, what does it tell us? Cardiac lesions. So those that would be the cardiac lesions. So um, the way we've set up the lectures is that in two months time, we, we, the next block that we will cover is, um, uh, 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 is, is the oh, lung. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then after that, we do cardiac lesions. And the four limb changes there would be indicative of a cardiac lesion. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. We just have a few more questions before we continue with the <clears throat> virtual demonstration. I apologize. Okay, so when do you consider to use sodium bicarbonate? It shouldn't be used, but a lot of doctors do use it. It generally now gets used only in the post-resuscitation phase. But if you go and look at all the literature out there, the, 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 it is no longer 
advisable. Um, it's just shown not to be very successful. But I do know that most um, NICUs still do these so-called soda big cocktails. But more and more as doctors are going to, 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 to courses, they are learning that, you know, the value is, is, is not that. Um, it, it is, it's not shown to work in the meta-analysis. Perfect, thank you. And now one of the last questions. What is the maximum time considered for a neonate resuscitation related to outcome effects? Probably like the, the, the others, it would be with regards to 20 minutes, um, depending on the temperature. A very cold baby or a child who's landed in a swimming pool, although in South Africa, um, we don't look at temperature that essentially because we don't get that very, very cold that you see that, you know, that happens. But um, it would de be dependent on the temperature, but generally uh, only 20 minutes because remember that the harm and um, done can be problematic. Although people have resuscitated for much longer and had very good outcomes, but they are rare. By 20 minutes, a call should be made. And then just on that, when you return that baby to the parent, give them the time to sit with that baby. As morbid as it is, give them the time because they need that time to mourn. Um, and they need to, to, to have that baby back. But prepare them for it. Tell them that the baby is coming back. I often find that one of the easier ways of doing it is to dress the baby and wrap it so it looks normal. Um, it just helps. Um, if they then want to undress it and look at it, that's fine. But just hand them, give them that opportunity. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, so far, we've answered all of the outstanding questions. And we are now going to move on to the, um, uh, to the, <clears throat> well, just to the uh, next part, where we will be doing a virtual demonstration of a um, resuscitator, Drager resuscitator, uh, which uh, I hope will answer a few of the questions that uh, have been addressed today. So we'll definitely talk about the um, um, we'll definitely talk about the respiratory rates and we will talk about the pressures and the APGAR. So um, with this, we are going to move on to the virtual demonstration. So. Um, I hope you can see the screen and you can see the, the device. So once again, my name is Margarita Singer, and in the next half an hour, I will take you through on how to optimize um, the setup on the resuscitator, on the Drager resuscitator, in order to uh, maximize the outcome of your resuscitation. Um, so um, as I mentioned, this is um, a Drager resuscitator. It's an open care warmer with an integrated um, resuscitation module. And um, just to say that we're going to have some more time for questions and answers. So if you still do have questions, either technical or clinical, please still type them in and we will address them after this part. So um, as I mentioned, we have the resuscitator here consisting of the radiant warmer consisting of the resuscitation module and of course on of the baby bed. So we have the possibility for the variable height adjustment, we have the uh, drawers, we have the trays, uh, but basically the main part that we are going to talk about today is the resuscitation module and how we can best optimize our resuscitation process. So let's have a look, what do we have here? And I'm going to switch to a closer look. So um, basically, if we look at the uh, navigation screen, we have the uh, main control where we can set up the temperature settings and the settings for the heating output of the radiant warmer. So um, 
We also have the possibility to activate the UpGuard timer, and we have some of the alarms and alarm, alarm silencer button. So um, we have the possibility to turn on the observation light to have better visibility of the baby. And uh, once I turn on the device by using this power button, we can uh, also log the screen to avoid any unnecessary adjustments. Uh, we have an integrated blender, so that means you can actually deliver blended um, air to the baby. So the blender works from 21% to 100%. So again, what Linda was referring, depending on the saturation, depending on the baby condition, we can uh, decide on the FiO2 settings for every patient. Then if we move on down, we are going towards the actual resuscitation module. So I'm going to move this a little to the side. So we have the integrated suction, which is extremely important during resuscitation, especially if we have a meconium aspiration syndrome or if we need to suction the baby. Uh, also, we have the patient's supply information, so the connection to the patient outlet. So this is how our standard uh, circuit looks like. Let me remove this for T-piece resuscitation. So you see here, this is our T-piece resuscitation circuit, and we connect it into the patient outlet. So the connection is pretty simple. It is written patient outlet. And then we can do the settings of the required parameters. So we can set the airway pressure, and we can set the flow rate. Um, and we also have the possibility uh, to monitor the uh, current pressure that is delivered to the baby. And I think this is very important, especially in comparison to the ample back resuscitation, because what Linda was referring, especially with very active movement of the finger, that first of all, we have no way to monitor the delivered pressure on the ample back. And that's why we have to be very careful on when we perform the resuscitation with the ample back. With resuscitator, uh, you are able to see the pressures that are being delivered to the patient. So you can observe and adjust based on the patient conditions. And you can adjust the uh, airway pressure by using the knob, by turning it up and down. And the same goes to the flow rate. You can adjust by using the knob, uh, turning up and down. Um, also, we have the information about the gas supply. So this is either connected to the wall supply, how we have it here, or how um, uh, we have, if you have cylinders, you can also connect it to the cylinders. I am going to leave out this part, the out of breath part on purpose, but I'm going to come back to it. So let's start by turning on the device. So we use the power button. Let's go up and see. So we turn on by using the power button and the device is going through a really quick self-check. This self-check includes the check of all the electronic mechanisms in the device to say that it's functional, that it's working. So now we also see the strange letters, P-R-E. What does it mean? It means that we are currently in the pre-warming mode. And what does it mean from the clinical protocol? Whenever you know that you have a critical baby that might require resuscitation, or in any other case, what we recommend is to turn on the device and the device will start in the pre-warming mode. So we see that we run at 100% output at 100% output, and it's warming up the elements, and uh, we are warming up the patient bed. So uh, basically, we are making sure that the when the baby is delivered, 
it's delivered to the warm space to avoid the, uh, first of all, the conductive heat loss to what Linda was referring, and also the radiative heat loss from the cooler area, cooler uh, temperatures in the labor and delivery world. So um, the device will stay in the pre-warming mode for three minutes. So we will run at 100% for three minutes. Then we, the device will automatically go to a 70% output for 12 minutes. And then after this uh, 15 minutes, the device will be at 30%. So it will make sure that it stays warm and keeps the patient area warm. So this is to support the workflow procedure. So, however, of course, we can change from pre-warming to the manual operation if the baby has already been delivered. So what we can do, we can press on this arrow here and we go into the manual mode. So once we switch into the manual mode, first of all, by having the temperature sensor, temperature sensor, it's a reusable temperature sensor, we are able to monitor the baby temperature and we are able to control manually the setting of the heater output. So in order to increase this, we can use the arrows up and down and we see that we can increase the output to a maximum. If, for example, now we clearly see that the baby is very cold, so we need to increase the output to the maximum. However, uh, if you see that it's too hot, we can also reduce the output to lower. So this is so-called manual mode, and we also have a baby mode. So what does it mean? What does a baby mode mean? Let's switch now. So the baby mode means that we, we now, or the device now automatically adjusts the heater output to reach the set temperature. And we actually advise to use all of your incubators, open care warmers, incu warmers in the baby mode. It's called baby mode. It's called um, servo mode, servo control mode, skin mode, to make sure that we have synchronization with the baby temperature. So now, obviously, we see that the temperature is extremely low. What I can do, temperature is very low. I'll try to warm it up a little. And first of all, we, we see that our target temperature is 36.5. Currently, we are at 24.8, which is very, very small. And we see that the heater power is at 100%. So now uh, the device is trying to work really hard to reach the set temperature uh, of, the, of the baby. What we also see is that we have an alarm, and I currently disabled it for two minutes, but we also have an alarm that the baby temperature is low. So you will always know that our baby's temperature is not reached because the device is giving you an alarm. Um, so, and you can use Resnessed Air as an open care warmer by just using these controls. So you can change, you can basically start with the uh, manual mode, start your operation while you're connecting. If the baby is not critical and does not require resuscitation, you can connect the temperature probe and you can start the manual. And then once the temperature probe is connected, you can switch into the baby mode and leave the baby to provide a little bit of thermal support um, while, uh, yeah, while, the, 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 while then the baby is then transferred to the mother. So there is a possibility for that. However, there are cases, of course, and Linda was talking about them at length, when uh, the babies require resuscitation. And um, one of the things that she mentioned is that it is absolutely crucial to have the timer. 
to have the clock running and I think she spent quite a bit of time on talking what is important during the first 60 seconds, uh, what is important during the second 60 seconds and the third 60 seconds. And we believe that um, everything should be available in a single device and therefore we have an upguard timer integrated into the Rizafetair. So when your baby is delivered, you can start by pressing the start and you have the timer for the, that counts the first 60 seconds and then basically it is the uh, upguard timer so it will count until 10 minutes. So um, the device will give you a, a, a sound notification at one minute, at five minutes and at 10 minutes. So your timer will be running and we're going to listen to one minute and you can always have the information how much time uh, has passed since the resuscitation started and it's easier to make notes and I think Linda highlighted it also a few times that it is absolutely essential that you take notes of all of your interventions and then you, uh, you uh, um, take the notes and support the notes with any documentation that you're providing post resuscitation. And we're, we're trying to make, here's your first minute uh, timer, we're trying to make this workflow as easy as possible. So you always have the information on how much time has passed since the beginning of resuscitation. So uh, now let's move on to the resuscitation module. So let's move down. So as I mentioned, we of course have the blender. So you can set the um, FiO2 setting or the oxygen setting between 21% to 100%. So it's quite easy. And uh, then uh, what we recommend is to start with the uh, standard setting. So we recommend to set the uh, airway pressure and the flow rate at one o'clock. So there is a little mark here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there is basically a mark here on top of the uh, pressure uh, settings that indicates the setting that is recommended to start from. And we now can, let me just show you, we can now uh, turn on the gas supply and I'm going to connect my lung. So now how do we perform a T-piece resuscitation? As I mentioned, we have the T-piece resuscitation. So now let's imagine we place the patient or we place the TPs and we now perform the resuscitation. And you see that when I do this, our pressure gauge is working and we can see how much pressure we actually delivering to our patients. And we can see, you see here on the top of the uh, TPS resuscitation uh, circuit, you can change, you can increase or decrease the PIP that we are delivering to our baby. So let me move it a little bit closer. Uh, let me see if it can focus. Can it focus? Okay, I apologize for that, but I will send a sample of the breathing module. So you see, when I perform resuscitation, we see that we can see how much pressure is being delivered to our pressure to our patient. So if I now increase the pressure, we can immediately see the pressure that we're delivering. And of course, there is a color indication. So there is the red zone, there is an orange zone, and there is a yellow zone. So if I now reduce the pressure, we see that we have just slightest uh, ch change in pressure. So we recommend to start at one o'clock and see if this is sufficient for your baby uh, or if this is sufficient for this particular patient and if not then you can change the adjustments. So um, TBS resuscitation circuit is quite simple so it only consists of a single limb 
However, what I would like to address here is the possibility, and I think we had one of these questions that uh, someone asked, how do you control the respiratory rate when you don't have the issues with the cardiac system? So basically, when you just need to perform respiratory resuscitation, how, what is the best way to, um, to optimize your ventilation? And we have, that was the five minutes um, sound, we have an answer for this. And the answer for this is the auto breath functionality. So we now have the possibility to set the desired respiratory rate, oh, just my arm is in the focus, uh, to, to, to set the desired respiratory rate, we see here, we can set between 18 and 60 breaths per minute. And we can set the PIP automatically. And we can start delivering this respiratory rate to the patient without the necessity to perform TP's resuscitation. So what does it mean from the clinical perspective? We are delivering more stable ventilation with a more stable respiratory rate that uh, first probably best clinical um, um, clinical outcome, but also from the workflow perspective, when, whenever you do a TPS resuscitation, one of your hands is always busy, or one person needs to always be responsible for counting the number of breaths being delivered. With out-of-breath, you can focus solely on your baby, on resuscitation, on making sure that the airway access is clear, on potentially uh, doing the intubation, on checking for other conditions. So you can solely focus on your patients while the resuscitator is do doing its job ventilating your patients. However, there are uh, a few things that we have to keep in mind and i'm going to switch to the bigger view so there are a few things that we have to keep in mind when we talk about out of breath and the first thing is of course the circuit so here we have a very simple circuit a single limb, limb circuit however for out of breath functionality we need a circuit like that so again we connect it to the patient outlet and we have the line that is going to exhalation valve so in order to be able to perform out of breath resusc or of resuscitation with out of breath we need to connect the exhalation valve so we connect it here on top okay now it's connected and you see the circuit the circuit looks a little bit diff different. So you see we have the PIP valve integrated as well in the circuit. Uh, the end exhalation valve, we connect to the device. And we now, we connect again the patient lung, or we connect the patient, in my case it's the test lung. And we again turn on the gas supply and now what we need to do, let's say, as Linda was saying, um, we need to, of course, provide um, substantial or efficient respiratory support, but we also need to give our patient the possibility to start breathing spontaneously. So that's why we set the respiratory rate between 30 and 40 breaths per minute. In our case, let's say, let's say 40. Uh, we need to check patients. Okay, we do that, um, and we turn on the outer breath. And you see that the device is ventilating our patient without me touching the circuit or without me basically thinking of the number of breaths that I'm delivering to my patient. So we automatically, Device is giving me an alarm again. We need to check the patient, of course, because the time has passed. I acknowledged it. So now we see we're ventilating our patient between the setting of PIP, 
the setting of the airway pressure and the respiratory rate. And the device is ventilating. So let's have a closer look on the uh, settings. So we have the settings for the respiratory rate, as I said, between 18 to 40. And let's say if I increase to 60, we see the device increased the number of respiratory rates automatically. If I now reduce back to 35, that was our up guard again, um, we are now back to 35 breaths per minute. I can also now manually control the PIP setting. So if we see, if we pay attention to the pressure gauge, now our PIP is higher. If I reduce it, now our PIP is much lower. Yeah. So here on the PIP setting, we also have like a little mark on top that indicates the recommended settings. But of course, depending on your patient condition, depending on the patient outcome, you can change the setting. Um, also, as still, you can control the airway pressure delivered. So if I now increase the pressure, we see that we go much higher. And if I now reduce the pressure, our pressure delivered to the patient is minimal. So, and this is what it, and this is particularly <clears throat> important to when Linda was referring to allow cuddles in the labor and delivery. What we can actually do, we can put our patient on the outer breath. We can open the side panel to have better access to the baby. We can even rotate the radiant warmer. For example, if the mom is positioned in a chair next to the resuscitator. So now we can easily help the mother and place the baby on the mother for that needed amount of time to allow the cuddles to really promote skin to skin contact. And by providing this, I mean, of course, mother is the right, is the perfect source of heat and they, they, she helps the baby with the thermal regulation, but we can still allow for this additional heat source to be on top of the baby. We, we have better access and the baby is being ventilated uh, with the set respiratory rate. So the nurses, they don't have to worry about TPS resuscitation, but they actually can allow this very important time for the mother and for the child to bond. So, um, of course, we have all the needed accessories. We have the trays, we have the drawers, um, we have the possibility. We have the possibility to remove the, uh, uh, the side panels for better access. But I think what's really important here is that we try to support the improving of the outcome during the resuscitation by using the outer breath. And we are trying to support the workflow in the labor and delivery by giving the nurses the freedom from this one aspect of resuscitation. And we are hoping to support the developmental care that comes um, together by, the, by giving the possibility for the mother and child to bond during this uh, precious time. So, um, with this, I would like to finish the virtual demonstration. I don't want to take any more of your time, but we do have quite a few questions which I, we still would like to address to close the session. So uh, I'm going to switch off the, uh, the resuscitator and I'm going to switch to the view that allows you to look at this and I'm going to address some of the questions that we have received in the last half an hour. So if you still have any technical questions, you can always also type them in into the question box. So excellent. We have received quite actually a few questions. I'm just trying to get to the last one. OK. Um, OK, so the question is, why we are placing skin probes in the right side of the abdomen.
Linda? You can place it on the right side of the abdomen. You must just be careful that remember that any baby's liver tips at about a centimeter. So it's best to sort of go closer to the umbilical area than right on the right side of it. Um, that would be it. I, I'm not fond of it because I don't think it's as accurate as if it's closer to the umbilicus or more to the leg. But, you know, that that is what it is. Thank you, Linda. Um, another question, the resuscitation can be used on intubated babies only. Um, please comment on this. Not sure I get the question. As the rest, the resuscitator can be used on any baby, um, but uh, no, you can resus without having to intubate. Many resuscitors are very successful without intubation, um, or the use of a laryngeal mask, a laryngeal tracheal mask, a LTM. Um, so you do not need to be able to intubate to resuscitate adequately. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. Okay, another question. Does this resuscitation mode in resuscitator consider a CPAP mode? Um, that's actually a good question. So, um, the no normal resuscitation, let's say without the uh, out-of-breath, um, is considered as your CPAP mode and can be used as a CPAP mode. Uh, so, you can just set the settings for the uh, for the peak level on the circuit, and you can um, uh, you can perform the step up resuscitation. However, if you activate the out of breath, this is more of a uh, continuous mandatory ventilation because you cannot reduce the respiratory rate to zero. So your minimum respiratory rate is 18. And so that's the minimum amount of breath that is going to be delivered to the baby. So if you activate, if you turn on the out of breath functionality, uh, you will get the minimum amount of breath at 18. So there is no way to reduce the respiratory rate to zero in order to simulate the uh, CPAP uh, resuscitation. Okay, uh, the next question. How, uh, how do you... How do you set the rates? Can 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 we explain how do we set the rates on the resuscitator? Linda, would you like to take this question, or um, how would you like to comment on this? Um, I think it's best you sort of deal with it, except to say that you know generally we would put the rates um, start off quite low if the baby's breathing by itself then and and just observe so give a support of maybe 20 and see where you go from there but i mean it's open for discussion because you know at 20 that might be all the baby needs if it's breathing in between yes i agree and i think what's important to mention here is what we're trying to achieve during resuscitation we're trying to achieve uh, um, consistent, spontaneous breathing. And if we are to provide too much support to the baby without, like if we set the respiratory rate at 60, that means that there's going to be one breath every second. So there will be very few possibilities for the baby to actually initiate the breath on their own. So I have to agree here with Linda that it's we can start with rather lower rates um, and see how the baby behaves. If the baby's respiratory drive is picking up and we see that the spontaneous breathing is picking up, then that's good. If we see that this is not enough, we can always increase the respiratory rate. But I think it's quite important to really try to allow the baby to uh, uh, start breathing spontaneously. And we're going to talk about it in more details during the next two sessions when we're talking about the respiratory system, the respiratory drive, and uh, the neonatal ventilation. But I think here it's quite important to remember that uh, what is our um, 
actual goal, which we're trying to establish spontaneous breathing. Okay, the next question, do you have scientific documentation to support the efficiency of resuscitation without a breast? Since some neonatologists during training said that this is not effective and does not have documentation support. Um, we do have some uh, case studies and we are currently looking for people who would like to do a case report uh, on the resuscitator. We don't have a clinical publication on the resuscitator functionality, but the e efficiency is there. And Linda, maybe from your perspective, from your clinical practice, can you comment whether the out of breath functionality is um, efficient or a good way for resuscitation? It would be a very good way because um, as I tried to explain, and I think in next month's lecture, we cover barrow trauma quite um, extensively, this method of resuscitation is controlled and um, it, it shows us the pressure. So at no stage can we overshoot the, that and cause barrow trauma, atelectic trauma, um, volume trauma to the lung. So for me, this would make far more sense. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. Um, another question, in out-of-breath modes, is the respiratory system integrated to the resuscitator alarm system in case of any respiratory alarms? Um, no, so here we're really trying to focus on the short-term resuscitation. We do not encourage long-term ventilation with the resuscitator. This is really used in, like, in the labor and delivery when the resuscitation is performed. If we see that the baby is failing and if we are to intubate our patient, we actually have a neonatal ventilator and we recommend to switch to the neonatal ventilator when the baby's condition deteriorates. So no, we don't have any respiratory alarm system integrated into the resuscitator alarm system because um, as I mentioned, this is uh, to support the short-term um, uh, resuscitation that is done in the labor and delivery. Okay, uh, the next question. Um, that is good if your patient ends up intubated with an ET tube, but what about if the baby only requires a CPAP and having skin to skin would still have to hold mask in place while out for cuddle? Um, Linda, can you maybe comment on this um, uh, workflow uh, related process. How do you how do you basically prepare the baby for the skin to skin cuddle when the baby is on CPAP or requires a, a mask mask intubation or mask uh, CPAP ventilation? So yeah, this this would be quite uh, it's it's not a hard um, thing. If for instance you're in a theater and you have the resuscitator, the resuscitator's um, oxygen, air and um, cord, electrical cord needs to be a bit more longer to move it closer to a theater bed or to a delivery bed. That would be number one. Number two is there's no reason why, and there are units now that are putting CPAP machines in the in the units and actually putting those babies onto CPAP and then moving them across onto the parent. It is just a matter of will. I think a lot of this is how you would like to see the start of attachment and to see the, the patient patient relationship going. It is it is totally doable from from all points and from all all situations. It is just our will to actually make it happen. And I think we can do that. Excellent. Um, thank you. So there are two questions on the resuscitator, uh, which are pretty much the same. Can you explain what is the auxiliary flow and the O2 outlet for, and also the difference between the flow rates on uh, liters per minute and the auxiliary flow in the resuscitator? That's an excellent question. So um, some of you might have noticed that we have the settings to the patient outlet 
So we see here where we have the settings, Oops, uh, yeah, you can still see, for the flow rate, and you can control from zero liters to 15 liters per minute. So this is your normal flow rate in the, um, in the system. What we also have here is the auxiliary outlet, and we are able to deliver 100% oxygen with the control for the flow rate for the 100% oxygen. Uh, let me check if I have the proof. So basically here, I don't have the current um, the tube here, so here you can connect uh, the tube and you can deliver 100% oxygen. So considering that we have a blender in the resuscitator, we can control the delivered air to the patient outlet, but if you need to deliver, or if you don't have the possibility to adjust this, or if you might not have the blender, you can always deliver the 100% oxygen by using the external outlet. So this is for the delivery of the, uh, you can also consider it as an uh, oxygen therapy type of um, delivery. So this would be the 100% oxygen. And uh, okay, there is a question. Um, can you comment on longer breaths of two to three seconds being beneficial for functional residual capacity? Okay, so I think what you're talking here is recruitment. Um, that would sort of be something that we would rather do later. Some pediatricians do do it, but it would have to be skilled because remember that babies need to exchange just like you other people. They, that, that's a recruitment maneuver. Um, you know, it would be something that we would prefer to rather do within a, 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 on a ventilator later and not really here. But some pediatricians do do it. As long as it's controlled, it should be okay. Excellent, thank you. So the next question, can you show us how to set PIP level with the alpha breast? It's actually quite simple. So you have the PIP, PIP level setting here. And again, we do recommend to start at the settings of one or one o'clock. And there is a little mark here, which indicates for the recommended settings. And then based on the patient, you can then adjust. But the starting point, there's like a little mark on top and you would be able to see that this would be our recommended settings for the PIP level. Thank you. And um, for now, we have the final question. How long should we give skin to skin when we bring the baby from NICU and if the baby is intubated? 10 minutes, you know, is basically what Dr. Clark is saying. They'll give them 10 to 15 minutes and then move them to NICU. Um, and that helps a lot. And, and I think for any parent, even if it was five to 10 minutes, um, it's, it's, it means the world. On his last webinar, he had a mother who could hold her baby. Um, it was a 23 weekend. She held him for five minutes and her husband held him for five minutes. And then they couldn't hold him again for eight weeks, but she held on to that five minutes she had. Um, and it's all to do with levels of, of hormones and how it helps them cope with depression. So. You know, five to ten minutes if is is fine, but if the baby's very stable, fifteen would be a benefit because it would take that baby that long to regulate, and that would allow you to in ICU have a far calmer transition. Thank you, Linda. I see that some of you are leaving. So before we finish, before we close the webinar. Um, there is going to be a post-webinar survey. We would really appreciate if you could fill in the survey with your feedback on the session, with the feedback on the future sessions. Uh, we would be happy to hear your feedback because I think it's very important to adapt and develop. So we will continue to improve based on your feedback. 
Uh, we have one more question. Can we use auxiliary outlets and uh, delivering of the free flow oxygen in the baby with the oxygen food therapy? Um, I think uh, we have to be mindful because, um, and I think Linda, you can comment on the overall oxygen food therapy, whether it's still practiced and how it's practiced. But um, here we need to remember that the, the outlets uh, the connection of the outlet might not allow you to connect the oxygen food uh, in order to perform the oxygen therapy, but you could potentially try to do that. Okay, so <laughs> a head box or the hood is, is almost no longer used, but I understand where the question comes from. And if that's what you've got, then that's what you've got to do. But please remember that you need to ensure flow because it's the flow that gets rid of the CO2 if the baby's breathing by itself. So it's ensuring that the windows are open or that the hood is lifted so the CO2 can escape. And I think we also should remember that delivering 100% oxygen can be harmful to the baby. And we will be addressing that, I think, in the next uh, session, Linda, right? Um, yeah. In the rest it's, it's very it's very harmful because it will affect their lung, it will affect their um, eyesight, it will affect intraventricular hemorrhage. So um, if you go and look at what the Von Dart is looking at, which is worldwide, the, the Vermont Oxford Network, um, they look at BPD or bronchoplastic dysplasia, IVH, intraventricular hemorrhage, NEC, ne necrotizing enterocolitis. They look at ROP and long-term sepsis. And oxygen in, in a toxic dose will affect four of those, of those five markers. So it's very important that we're very careful with our oxygen and that we don't overshoot. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda. And we have answered all of your questions. We will again review the questions after the webinar and we'll see whether we need to provide a written answer for anything. I would like to thank you all for staying with us for these three hours. Um, I really appreciate your engagement. I really appreciate all of your questions. Our next webinar for the Digital Neonatal Nursing course is scheduled for May 20th. We do have this large break because we would like to honor the holy month of Ramadan. And we understand that some of you uh, might be fasting and will be fasting. So we want to respect that. And therefore, we have decided to continue with the next session for after the Ramadan on 20th of May. And we want to talk about the respiratory system. However, in order to continue this learning curve for you, as Linda has mentioned, we are uh, planning to schedule a like an hour to one and a half hour webinar with Dr. Clark on the topics of cuddling in the labor and delivery and the importance of skin to skin contact on April 29th. We will update um, all the information in the on our website. So the website where you have registered for this course, please um, uh, look for the um, for the announcement. And we will also send out the notification uh, to the emails. So thank you so much. Uh, please fill in the, um, the form, the survey. The webinar recording and uh, uh, presentations will be available to you. We will send out the links to download those. They're going to be available on uh, YouTube. And again, Linda, thank you so much for this excellent session, I think. We all have learned a lot, and if you still have any questions, you can always reach out to Linda or to myself, and we will try to get you an answer. So thank you so much, and I'm wishing you a great day ahead, and great weekend for those of you who have weekends, and we will reconnect hopefully in the end of April, and then we will come back to the neonatal nursing course uh, in, on May 20th. I look forward to speak with you all soon and have a great day, everyone.